you'll learn in the course of uh, what I'm going to say that uh, innovation within a large industry, a large pharmaceutical business like Pfizer, is actually a team. It's a team effort, and I was I was part of that team. But you'll also learn, and I think uh, Kanya alluded to this, that if you're a woman on the team, you're never forgotten, particularly if it's to do with sex, drugs, or rock and roll. <laughs> and um, I was was a. a amazed and astounded and horrified after doing an interview with the uh, Telegraph a couple of years ago and, and pleading, pleading uh, for, for, for this piece about Viagra to, to, to be put into, into context, only to discover that the headline was 25 million men have reason to be grateful to Dr. Jill Samuels. <laughs> and, um, you know, th that's the time, girls, when you're glad your mum's dead. And you're sort of, uh, you know. This is a quote that I, I particularly like. Really, what we're about is enabling scientists to use science in a way which delivers the future. We can't foresee the future, but we can enable the future. We can enable people, if we get it right, to live longer and healthier lives. If we get it right, the consequence of delivering to the patient what they need will have a big economic impact. And you'll know that this is very much on people's minds, particularly in the less developed countries, that, that they know the, the close contact between development and, um, and health and that we need to be alert and agile because there are always new diseases appearing and there's new science appearing. So let me talk about progress in science and how do we get to where we want to be. Well, clearly we have to have a science base, the pure science, the stuff that's done in academia. Industry then goes and applies it and it applies it hopefully to discover and develop, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry, a new medicine. And in order to actually be able to apply it, you need an appropriate socio-political environment. So really, progress in science, the delivery of a new medicine, depends on this intersection here between pure applied science and the <coughs> socio-political environment. This is education, training, curiosity, observation, training, discovery, invention, and this is the enabling environment. And I just want to say a couple of things about the enabling environment because this is critically important, particularly to those of us who have a degree of public exposure because of what we happen to deliver. Uh, so the socio-political environment is comprised of, of the reputation of any industry or any individual within that industry, uh, of permissive regulation or controlling regulation, and of specific policy interventions. So, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry, this would be things like NHS policy, it would be policy around education, it would be push and pull systems. In terms of regulation, this would be enabling regulation which allows you access to specific technologies, whether they're gene technologies, being able to use animals in medical research. And this chunk is all to do with being open and transparent. And if, uh, if you'll remember what happens when it goes wrong, you only need to recollect the problems that Monsanto had when they tried to introduce GM crops, particularly in Europe, and the Daily Mail labelled it Frankenfoods, and after that, there was nowhere else for them to go. So what's biomedical innovation about? It's about delivering value to the patient, to society, and to the shareholder. Now, when I regularly used to give talks about Viagra, you, you can imagine that there was always a, both a, a ripple of enthusiasm and a few quiet um, sniggers in, in the audience. Uh, and I learned to handle that by actually showing the letters that we'd had from some of the patients. And when you actually see a patient who's been involved in a clinical trial and really wants to continue with the therapy, even before it's been approved by regulators, and that individual writes to you and says, it stopped me beating my wife. Or another person writes to you and says, it stopped me killing myself. And the audience has gone very quiet now, so you hear the patient speak to you. And that's the important piece. That's the turn on. That's the biggest turn on when you actually, by working in an international team by, which employs uh, groups of vastly different experiences, of vastly different ethnic backgrounds, both men and women, 
and you get to that point. That's the real signal for success. So the patient's benefit, it can be uh, actually uh, freedom from disease or disorder. Society benefits because the patient can then return to work full time. Anybody who uh, has uh, had a bad chest infection, which is actually a bacterial chest infection, will know the benefit of, of a decent antibiotic. Um, and it provides value to the shareholder. So uh, it's an industry which intends to make a profit. That profit is good all the way around because it means that we get taxed, which is part of the virtuous cycle, which means that money is provided to the government because governments don't make money, they just redistribute it. And it also provides things, most pension funds uh, invest in big industries. So really this is part of a, a virtuous cycle. But how do you maintain innovation? Because how can a system that produced something like Viagra actually produce something which has just been announced in public now, which is a, a radical new therapy for HIV AIDS, which is something which doesn't attack the virus, but which blocks the receptor on the cell surface, which allows entry of the virus into the cell, which is a real pathogenic step. So how does an organization actually gear itself up with a distance between those two events? Viagra was launched sometime in the early 90s, and this compound for HIV AIDS is probably going to be launched sometime probably around about 2010 or something like that? The answer is that you actually have a portfolio of programs ongoing. And that portfolio of programs actually feeds into this long chain which has the elements in that I already described to you. The, the basic science, the clinical development, all the data which you, you develop, which gets submitted to regulatory authorities, so you fulfill regulatory requirements, then goes into the healthcare systems. And the, when you get into the healthcare systems, you earn the money, which allows you to reinvest in R&D. So there are two things that are very important in R&D, in addition to the factors I've spoken about. One is project management, so it's how to get a self-managing system. And the second thing is about how you choose your research portfolio. So uh, any company's research portfolio is based primarily on medical need. Where are the major medical needs? Secondarily, where's the durability? Do we know enough about that disease or disorder? And is there enough basic science to get there? I believe very strongly that the secret of success, whether you're a, an entrepreneur in the same way that Kanya is or Karen is, or whether you're an entrepreneur in a big company. It's finding a job you can be passionate about or creating a job that you can be passionate about because it's that passion that will sustain you through the difficult times. And particularly if you're a woman in those challenging times, it's important to be, have, find something you're passionate about and keep the faith because there will be times when you're down, but not for long, of course. And I found this quote, which I just thought was great. It was a friend and a colleague out of the WHO who sent this to me on his, his retirement. Think enthusiastically about everything, but especially about your job. If you do, you'll put a touch of glory in your life. If you love your job with enthusiasm, you'll shake it to pieces. <coughs> you'll love it into greatness. And I think that's true. Even in a big organisation, there are huge opportunities to make a career, to make a difference, to break the mould, to be in the tent rather than outside the tent. And to that point, and I think Irene spoke about the challenges of being a woman in big business. Now, I think I'm probably a bit thick-skinned, but I've never experienced a glass ceiling. Um, or perhaps I've just been, been, been fortunate. But many industries are aware of the challenge of not just being able to recruit good women, because we can recruit good women, but keeping them and developing them and putting them in a place where they can deliver value. So, the door is open, be passionate, keep the faith, and you'll have fun as well. Thank you.